Web Accessibility Wonderland con Diana Rodríguez. Hi there. Just a second, I'm putting a timer on my watch. Okay, so can everybody can hear me okay? Okay, so hello everybody. Hopefully you're not too hungry because yeah, I know it's almost lunchtime, but hopefully this will be fast enough. Okay, I want to talk today about, oh, when I'm getting closer, it goes loud. Okay, is it better like that or like that? Okay, so I want to talk today about Web Accessibility Wonderland. I mean, there was already a previous a talk that was amazing. Thank you for that. And cover some of the things I'm going to say today. But also I want to talk another other thing. So hopefully you, I'm not getting this right. Like that? Yeah. Okay, so let's dive into the why and how. I mean, why accessibility and how can we improve it? Okay? Is this? No, it's not working now. Ah, just a second. Oh, the slides are not working. Oh, now they're working. Okay, so first of all, who am I? I have been a QA for almost seven years. You can find me on Twitter, X, or whatever you like to call it these days. And I want to talk to you a little bit about accessibility. Uh, so let's jump into the next slide. First, I'll tell you a little bit why I'm going to tell you this story now. And I have two main reasons. I have a personal reason and then a professional one. The professional one is that in my work, I, I mean, our application has to be compliance by law because we, we operate in the education sector in the US, so we could get big fines if we are not compliant. And I actually, I started to learn a lot about accessibility in that process. And it makes me wonder what I didn't know anything before. So I was like, why? And the worst part is that not many people know a lot about this story, so I started to dig into, the, into this, and it was like, maybe it's worth to take a look and talk about this to someone, right? And the second part is I have someone in my family who has a ALS. I don't know if you're familiar with ALS. It's the same disease that Stephen Hawking had. And I have learned how that person has used the web in a different way that maybe you're getting used to even with screen readers. So it's not the same. So for both things, I think it was worth to talk about accessibility today. And it was like, okay, maybe someone cares about it and apparently people want to listen to it. So let's, let's jump into that. My agenda for today is, I mean, I'm gonna talk about accessibility on the web, but not that much. Also about some functional diversity style also about the WCAG, are the standards, the status of the web, some regulations, and then my fun part here, and it's actually what I really think it could be useful for you, are the guidelines I'm gonna propose to you so you can start implementing accessibility. Okay, so the why. I mean, I already mentioned accessibility is important because uh, it's, it's the web. No, not working now. Okay. So, and I'm gonna use this code from World Health Organization that is an estimated of 1.3 billion people experience significant disability. And notice the word significant here, because this stands for the 16% of the world's population. That means that one of six of us has some significant disability. But I was, as was mentioned in the, in the talk before, there are also permanent, dis I mean, uh, there are permanent disability, disabilities, temporal disabilities, and situational disabilities. So this is only a number for the significant one. But for example, you can have like a temporal, you can maybe break your arm, or you can have like a situational one that for any reason you cannot use your left hand. In the example, you were holding a baby, so that was a great example for that. And so that, this is not the only amount of people with disabilities, with significant disabilities. And about the work significant, I want to make a quote here that in Spain, I think in from 2005, they have changed disability word for functional diversity. So I'm going to talk about functional diversity, but in the end, it makes the same. But it's a more inclusive term. I mean, whatever you like to call it, but I prefer functional, functional diversity. So. Okay, so accessibility for me is the ability to access. I remember I read some this maybe in Wikipedia, and I know Wikipedia sometimes cannot be the source of truth, but it seems like a good concept to define accessibility. I mean, 
you can, so everybody can, ha can use uh, in your environment and do the same actions without, despite of any functional diversity you might have. So if you add the web plus accessibility, then you have the web for all of us. So I have a question for you, and I want you to ask yourself, like for just a moment, is your web, your current web, your current service you're working on accessible, like for real? I know, I mean, if you say no, you're not alone. So, but it's okay, uh, because this is something, I mean, this is a big problem we have in today's, in today's web, I mean, in, in software development in general. But hopefully, I will make you, I'll, I will give you something to help you with that. So I, I'm going to mention functional diversity type, and I don't want to go deeper, because, uh, I mean, we can be a whole afternoon talking about functional diversity type. I added a resource from, jail, from a jail article that talks more about each of them. But we have, for example, visual, like you have color blindness, and you have maybe people that cannot see. And you can also have another type that's cognitive lear learning and neurological, for example, as someone with HDHD, also auditory, for example, people who are deaf, who has uh, some kind of loss of hearing, and also like physical, for example, an amputation. So it's important to note this because we may think that accessibility in the web is only by using the keyboard, but as you can see, there are many types, many different types. So. That's what I wanted to point this slide. I'm not going to go deeper than this, so you can take a look to the resources later. So, as I mentioned, you see so many different things like visual, hearing, and physical. So they're not. You. It's hard to think. How can you? How can you target your web to all these users, right? Because they're they're different. There's not the same significant functional diversity. So. Luckily, we have something for this. And then there's the WCAG Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So these are standards developed by the W3C. Also, as well, I won't go deeper than this. You can go later, take a look. I added some resources, so you can also check WCAG. But there's, and notice this, these are standards. There are no legal requirements. So this is uh, the guidelines that you can, you can use to, uh, to implement accessibility in your project. And also WC3, WCIG, as I mentioned, are technical standards on web accessibility developed by the Wor World Wide Web Consortium. And not working, not working. Okay, and the last thing I'm gonna say about WCIG is are the, are the level of conformance. Then we have the, the conformance A, that is, uh, is the bare minimum. Usually it's not considered acceptable when you get an auditory or, but it's something that maybe you can aim when you do an MVP of a product, for example. We also have the WA, that usually is the, the, one, the one that are required by law, and also the AAA, that in specific cases is quite hard to archive, but it's something that you can also. And I wanted to mention this because sometimes you think, okay, what, where do I wanna go? Maybe you can go to a conformance level AA, that is a typical one. That's why I didn't wanna skip this part from WCAG. Also, and now this is the fun part, and it's also mentioned in the other slide, uh, the status of the web, because you know, you like to hear some data, right? It's not like, okay, we need to be accessible, but how bad we are? Well, let's see about that. We have the WebAM million report, that was mentioned also <laughs> in the other slide, and it's, it's a report that analyzes one million pages, and I put them one million in big, that are pages analyzed using Tranco ranking. You can take a look deeper what are the criteria for Tranco ranking, and let's see what they find, right? Because a million pages could give you some results. It's a big sampling, right? Okay. For example, I use, and I like to compare it with 2023 results, and as you can see, in 2023, there was an average of 50 errors per page, right? So that means that uh, at least in a page, could, you can have 50 errors, which could potentially stop people from using your website. And the worst part, and the bad part, is that it has increased to a 13.6%. So that means we have gotten worse in the media of errors we have found. Then I have this slide. So, no worries. And, and this one is quite interesting because these are the top 
top errors are, are found, and you can see in timeline slides, and the, the, the bigger the one that is, I mean, you can see also in time how it goes a little bit down, but still they're too high. We have, for example, the low contract stacks, that you have, for example, a button, and the background is a different. Is very similar the color. So for some people, that could be quite tricky to use. We have the missing alt text. That is, you have an image, but you don't have a text. So people who are reading with a keyboard that are blind, for example, they are not able to know that image, and I mean to see what image contains. Also missing labels. For example, you have a button. And I have, this is actually something that happened to us, that you have a button, but then you have like a label that describe it, for example. And see, maybe your button says, press here, but you could, if you have like a label or description by, that were mentioned four times in the other slide as well, uh, you can, you can uh, people doesn't really know what button could be, because remember, you just read that button, maybe you skip some part. It's like, okay, press here, but you don't exactly know where you're gonna go or what that press is gonna be if you may not add this alt text, uh, this alt text property. Also, the missing labels, and I'm sorry, missing labels, I, I got it wrong. The empty links, for example, if you have an A tag with an empty link, that could confuse a lot of users with, uh, I mean, with, with technologies to, you, to read the web in a different way. Uh, that means that that link doesn't link anywhere, and it's like, okay, I'm, I'm doing this, but I'm not able to do it. Since you can see that maybe that could be broken, that's something that really impacts users. Also, empty buttons, buttons that don't do anything, or maybe they say they're gonna do something and that don't, that could be a lot of misleading, mostly for people who they're using only the keyboard to do that. And also the missing language, that is for example, the doc type of your page. So you don't, you need, for example, you reach a page, but you don't know what language. So the screen reader uh, that could, could struggle. I mean, other assistive technologies could struggle with that a lot. And this one is a little hopeful from that report, but I mean, it's still not, enough, but last year in 2023, then uh, 96.3 of home pages had detected WCAG2 failures. And now, that, what, what that does mean, that 96.3 90, of a million pages had at least had failures somehow. So that means a lot of pages that could potentially not be accessible. In 2024, that, that number has low has decreased a little bit, but still 0 0.4 is not enough. So the conclusion here is that they're quite sad stats, right? I mean, what you can see from this is that your website potentially, and not yours, probably almost all of the website that unless you, you, you take a look to this, are not accessible. Okay, let's continue. And I'm, I wanna talk like an overall, you can go deeper if you want about regulations. And um, I wanted to focus on Spain, but you can focus on any, re I mean, every region could have different regulations. So I put like a small timeline of some laws that has been implemented on Spain uh, through the years, trying to tackle accessibility. Unfortunately, uh, most of these laws, uh, I mean, all of them uh, are mostly for government websites, but for private sector, it's, pretty, it's barely nothing. So the good part somehow is that more regulations are coming, and now I'm gonna talk about European Accessibility Act. <laughs> so uh, there's a law that will be, will be starting to, I mean, will, will be applied starting on June 28, and this is important because this could affect you all, that new service I mean, new service, new products uh, covered by the Act are, are going to be required by law to be accessible. F and then a five-year transition period begins for new services. And for June 2030, that transition period ends. You, for, and technically, depending on your case, if you are a new service or uh, an existing one, you could get applied fines and penalties. And the key thing here, and what we don't know, because for GDPR they have an ICO organism in the UK, but there's no speci specificity of how each country is going to apply this. So this could seem like a small hope, but until we don't know using it, we may not know how this is gonna work out, but hopefully it will be better. And this is something I wanted to say before I continue. Accessibility is not about regulation, it's about inclusivity, it's about everybody uses the web. So I, 
I mean, regulations, unfortunately, are the ones that force us sometimes to do stuff because it's hard to tell a product manager that, I mean, it's not hard, so sometimes people don't take that, don't give value to that. So, regulation, for example, if you tell your product, okay, I need my web accessible, and they say, why? And it was like, I want to include all of the users so the users can use the web. And then he's going to say, but why? And most of the time, unless we give some money data, for example, we have potential revenue or whatever, or you are going to be fine, it's not taken into account. So that's the point of the talk today. It's like, so try to push try to push accessibility implementation in your projects because everybody's using it and hopefully regulations will help you get there, but it's not the main focus. The main focus is that to use the web for everybody. And then I'm gonna jump in to the how. Okay, I wanna. And the how is how can you do it? I mean, how, I'm gonna give you some guidelines. I'm gonna propose you some guidelines so you can implement accessibility in your projects. Hopefully some of them work for you. Maybe some of them you have used them or not. I don't know. Okay, the first of all, you need to update your accessibility know-how. I mean, if you don't know what to do, how can you do it, obviously? So you can use, for example, the WCAG guidelines. There, as I mentioned before, the guidelines explain, I mean, they're standard, they explain you in each case how, how can you reach that point. Also, there are some W3C courses, and my favorite, and I added in the resources, is the web dev, dev from Google. It, they have a special part from accessibility that is, they talk about, I think, all of the, all of the elements in the web and how, wh how each of them could have er errors and how can you fix each one of them. So maybe there's somewhere you can start. Also, you need to identify your project accessibility requirement because if you don't know where you're gonna go, what's your minimum to tackle, then you will struggle a lot with it. For example, you can, you can understand who are your users, but for example, if you have like a website that is mainly focused on, I don't know, something that people with certain disabilities could use the most, that could be like the main focus, also include people from, with functional diversities in the UX research. What I mean with that, I mean if you are doing like a focus group, testing your application or, or testing your prototype, then include these people because they will have a different version of what you actually think of in your mind because they have a different perspective also. Also, identify regional accessibility regulation. As I mentioned, they could be different in all of the countries of the world and you need to know where you are present and depending on that you need to take into account certain things or not. For example, I, I'm making this up. In a country you need to have a triple A, I'm making it up. Then you need to fulfill that regulation that depends where you are. And also, as I mentioned, you need to identify the conformance desired level. As I mentioned in the first slides, we have A, double A and triple A. Usually it's double A, but maybe your project is different. The third part, you need to assess your current state of accessibility. And how can we do that? I mean, just like that cat is testing that glass, then we need to, to take a look to test our website, I mean, where we are. And I forgot to mention, these are guidelines for existing projects, but could also be applied to new projects. For example, you can use an, an easy to start guide that is in the resources that, from the W3C, that's quite, it's like a checklist, then you can start to check, okay, I have this, I have this, I have this. Also, just try your application by simply using the keyboard. Sounds silly, but you'll find a lot of stuff just by that. And the, the pretty part here is that usually people take a look to the home page or maybe to the second screen, but each page of your application could have potential accessibility issues that you may not notice. And using the keyboard is, is a very easy way to take a look to that. Also, you can run out this with Lighthouse, Accept Tools, or Wave. I mean, these are like Chrome extensions. They're pretty simple. So it's just to have a first, a first look to that. Also, you need to team, to team up and raise awareness. And this is something that I think is mentioned in all the talks. I mentioned it before. Your team needs to understand the need for this. And this is the hard part. Try to get some numbers, try to... Uh, try to identify your potential profit, try to conf convince them somehow, because 
if you don't, usually if you don't give money reasons, you, you will not be implemented, but it needs to be. So for that, I mean, you need to raise awareness that accessibility is not in the developer side. Every person in the team is involved. For example, design needs to take a look to the color contracts, I mean, to many things that, and also from product side, I mean, there's a typical question that's asked that, okay, so how far this could go? I mean, at some point, hopefully, this should be in the management level because if you don't have that need from the upper part of your company, it's hard to push it yourself because it's fine, yeah, I can push it, but if nobody else is doing it, then you probably miss the checks either way. So this is something to be in a team. Also, you can participate in development and maintenance of a design system. I mean, if you already have one, you can consider include, include accessibility, for example. Also, you can consider semantic HTML. I mean, you've probably seen semantic HTML somewhere else. It's quite simple and it could help you like for th seven, it could increase like 17% just by changing. I mean, I know this is a very positive number, but also, you can also uh, consider include uh, accessibility as an acceptance criteria. You know DODs, we have the DODs that is acceptance criteria or whatever you like to call it. And, and then the, five, the fifth part. So this like the more, the more, the more, the, the one I like the most is about the tooling. And this is something that you can start doing today. I mean, all of them, but here you can see somehow how can you start now. And I have, there are some interesting things here. So there are different criteria on how far can you cover accessibility in your test. So for example, in the UK, the UK government, they said that in this report I added at the resources, they said that you can cover top 30 to 40% in an automated way. So I mean, depending how you look at it, that's not a really high number. And also from the report from DQ Labs, that they're the ones that support Access Core, uh, they said that you can cover up to 57.38. So they're quite different numbers, right? And the problem here, there's not like a similar criteria. So, and the, the thing is that people has understand at least for today, hopefully in the future we'll have more, we could cover more in, I mean, when I talk about coverage, it's not like the regular coverage. Okay, my code is, is it's usually like test all the use cases of accessibility with automated tools. So we need both manual and automatic tools. And let's talk about manual, for example. And for manual testing, we, you can use wave evaluation tool. I think I mentioned all of three before. You can use Access tool as well. The, for Wave and Access, you have a Chrome extension also for Lighthouse. I mean, Lighthouse has other tooling, but you can use Lighthouse for manual testing, although it doesn't give you much information. I, I prefer, honestly, Wave or Access, but Lighthouse gives you like an overall, mostly if you just wanna assess your accessibility level. They give you like a percentage, they tell you 10% or 30, or I don't know, depending on your website. Also, we, you, can, you need to use a screen reader for testing because uh, you have, for example, the voiceover for Mac, the NVDA, or JAWS, and I put here to the next part a slide when there's different screen reader and the top usage. This is a survey from WebAM. So, and the key part of a screen reader, that they, all, they do not work the same way. So maybe your voiceover from Mac could, could get some data and could understand the flow better, but maybe for NVDAs or job is harder. So this is something to consider, at least to use one, I, I think voiceover, I mean voiceover is the default for Mac, and NVDA or JAWS, I think it's JAWS, is like the default for Windows. This is the one that is mostly used. So if you don't wanna test NVDA because maybe you can, you don't have enough time, you can use at least the one for Mac and JAWS, so they're like cover different operative system. And then we have the automated testing part. And this part, uh, as I said, depending on your criteria, there's a different criteria, but this is the, the part where you can actually automate your test and make sure that, it's, that they're, they pass green until you promote the production, for example. Oh, okay. At low level, you can, for example, use just access 
in your components that to test your accessibility at unit test level. Sometimes we cover some cases in end-to-end -end testing, but if you want to cover all the flows, maybe you can have a bigger suite in end-to-end. -end. So Jess could be helpful for you. Uh, Sorry, uh, SLIN, you can also use SLIN or any kind of validator for static code. For example, SLIN plugin JSX for, access for, for React and also could be very useful. I mean, trying to follow the testing pyramid, pyramid, but in a lower level, like unit testing level component, like maybe SLIN for statics and then end to end. For example, you, for end-to-end -end testing, you can use Playwright, Cypress, or Selenium, depending on your stack, depending on what you want to use. I personally recommend Playwright, but that's up to you in the end. Maybe you already have a framework use. So I, they work. I mean, I only have experience with Playwright check accessibility checks, and they're quite interesting. And the last part, and I'm almost done here, uh, this is something that you need to do. I think for my side, because uh, it's not worth anything that if you do a lot of accessibility testing and you don't include that in your CI. So next time you deploy something, you make a change in your component, then your, I mean, your accessibility code, your, your tests are going to break and you won't even notice. it. So if you don't include it in the CI, this is so funny, sorry. Uh, so for example, you can use Pali. The Pali is, uh, is a tool that is quite useful. Actually, it's the one that we are using right now for the CI. We are planning to migrate to end-to-end -end testing for Playwright because Playwright accessibility, you can have more, you can do more stuff. But if you just want a simple thing like checking, for example, a, a smoke flow, Pali is quite useful. We also have Access CLI. I think Access is paid. And you can also include Lighthouse. Lighthouse is a little slow, mostly on pipelines, but could work for your project depending on how far you want to go. And this is an example of a GLAB pipeline where you can see this is actually our case. We have a job in our pipelines where you, we test accessibility. So you can see uh, accessibility audit there. And that's it. And I have also some bonus point for new projects. Uh, you. I mean, if you have a new project, for example, the ones that need, will be these laws that will be applied after June 28, uh, get involved early because it's easier to tackle it at the start than later when you already have a consolidated product to implement accessibility. It could be quite tricky. I mean, you probably have many lines of code that you need to edit, and that could get quite messy. Also, at least if you have an MVP, for example, or try to enforce a WCAG level A support. I mean, this may be hard, but as I said, if you read all the data in the slide one, you could do it easier. And also, I have a very fast demo, very fast, I'm, I'm done. And I'm gonna show you, and this is gonna be a different demo, not the regular ones that you might see, because I record myself using a night tracking device, so all the actions I'm gonna do with, in the video are with my eyes. So the eye tracking device, for example, is that with people that cannot move their, their arms, they use their eyes to control the computer. So the eye tracking, I mean, it's not the best demo ever. I, I'm not a good YouTuber. I've never been good recording myself, but hopefully you like it. And you see with how, I mean, you see, my, you see the screen, the Windows screen, because it's a device that, that is plugged into Windows. And you see my eyes, I mean, Probably is, will be, can be improved, but let's let's jump into that. Okay, I mean this doesn't have. So that's me. I'm not gonna use the hands. <laughs> I'm hiding in here, and this is a demo device. I hide all the copyright and all the. I hide it down there, so I'm using Firefox, for example. And now I'm using my eyes there. I'm not using my hands. As you see, this, I see my, I mean, you can see me there in the screen. So I'm struggling a lot to move, to move the mouse. And then what I, what I just did is I, I, I click on, on the Google bar and I'm going, now I'm writing with my eyes. As you can see, I just write an S. I wrote mis accidentally in a space because I'm not a good user. I also use, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm writing their accessibility, hopefully. I think I made a mistake again. I mean, I had to record it because it's quite hard. I mean, people with this needs a lot of practice. 
But now I think I, no, that one I, I, I added correctly. Uh, accessibility. <laughs> It's, it's, it's not that long demo, don't worry. You won't be seeming there like for 10 minutes. So I just wrote the K, miswrote mis the K because I'm bad, like I said. And then I, okay. I'm trying to get, okay, I put it, I think it's a yay, I put it bad, but okay. <laughs> I mean, it's hard because you don't know what you're doing there. If you move your eyes to read, you get like, I mean, it's quite crazy. And now I, I'm gonna click enter at some point. <laughs> and I, I made a mistake because I'm trying to, oh no, no, this part I do it okay. This is the one where I try to close the keyboard. I, now I need to close the keyboard. <laughs> but as you can see, the time is not enough because I'm not used to it, so I open the, calcul the calculator <laughs> instead. <laughs> now I need to close it with my eyes. And then I open it again like three times until I get it right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's almost done. And again, <laughs> I think I did it three times because I almost caught it, but I thought it was funny to leave it like this, how these tools are, I mean, you need practice with your eyes because they're not easy. I think this time is the good one. Okay, now I need to scroll down because as you can see, this is a Google, Google form, I mean, a Google form that I need to accept. So I'm using the scroll down feature. And now I'm, I need to put my eyes, because you need to put your eyes there, so the, so the screen know that you want to scroll there, and then it puts you to the right that I, as I said, I'm not a good YouTuber. I put my camera on top, but I just scroll, and then I'm gonna click on accept. Hopefully one day. <laughs> Even it's hard, it's quite hard. And there you go. So as I said, it's not easy tools. For example, if you have pop-ups or if you have a, a, like a very small button, it's quite hard to use eye tracking. So this is a different example, I'm done, I'm done now. And the last part, remember accessibility is about all of us, it's about all to have the same rights and opportunity in the web and outside the web. So everybody can, I mean, it, we all need, it needs to be implemented. I know this is not the best conclusion, but I'm done with time. So thank you all. And there are some resources there uh, for all the for everything I have mentioned. So thank you very much, Diana. I don't know if you it doesn't matter for you the language of the questions or I don't mind if you want to ask in Spanish, that's okay as well. Okay, so any questions? ¿Alguna pregunta? Sí, por allí. Fue muy rápido. Hablé muy rápido. Me controlé. Well, Diana, first thing, thank you for your presentation. I was wondering if in your development team or uh, in general, I don't know, developers, product people, do you have people that actually need these accessibility resources to work and use them on a daily basis? Yeah, I mean, as I said, in the project I work, uh, we are certified by accessibility. We even have tests in our pipelines to recheck that, for example, if you migrate the components, something that we're doing now, we're migrating from React 17 to React 18. There are some things, or even CSS styling, that you need to change. We have ch uh, checks in pipelines. We use the weather dev resources. And we also have audits. I mean, in the audits, they even tell you, OK, you have broke this, and you need to fix this. So I'm not sure if that answered your question. No, I meant, sorry, I meant people working with you that are users of accessibility. Like, oh, they are no. hearing impaired, visually impaired, and they need a screen reader to work, and so on. Hopefully, I mean, hopefully one day, but not today. Yeah. Okay, That's thank you. That I was would curious. Be nice. No, it's fine. That's no, fine. That's a good question. Any other, any other question? <laughs> ah, okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> First thing, I want to apologize. I don't want to bomb your, <laughs> your no, presentation. No, I mean, it was a good introduction because I didn't go deeper. So it's like if someone saw his talk, that was quite good. And you can learn, you'll learn more about accessibility. <laughs> Thank you. I was wondering 
in your case, I think you said that you need to be compilers on that. I, I want to know how difficult it is for your UX team to be compilers though. I mean, uh, when I joined my team, there was already, I mean, it was already compliance, but when it was, I, I, I know I was not there at the moment, there was like a big, uh, I mean, we were not compliance at all, so there was big changes. We even put like the color contracts in Confluence, for example, we try to write down in a, in a guideline so people from UX follows that guideline. Actually, we're working now on a design system that we don't have, and Technically, the UX people should follow that design system that we're going to do. Hopefully, that answers your question. <laughs> so, any other question? No? Okay, so thank you very much. Gracias, Diana. Okay,